Welcome to this focus tutorial on how to create a melee combat system with free visual game engine gdevelop. Those who follow our videos with some regularity, already know that we are mainly covering long series of videos to build complete games, but in the middle, we can cover specific elements with one-time videos to explain a mechanic or a specific feature and how it can be implemented. In this case, we are going to cover the melee combat system. For those who don't know what it is, a melee is basically a close combat situation with swords, sticks, or fists and that is the opposite to long-range mechanics like shooters or other types of games. In a melee, a player can fight one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many enemies, with a sword, and the blows can either affect only one enemy, light attack, or several enemies with heavy attacks. To make it happen, we need to find a way to implement the range of the attack, and since it is a very specific attack with a very specific weapon, the actual frame or series of frames where the damage will actually be done. Remember that we consider these types of videos to be more focused on intermediate and advanced developers, so we are considering that you have a good knowledge of G-Develop and we will not comment all the clicks and paths to reach settings or functionalities of the engine. Let's jump into it. The first thing that we need is a good starting base. We could create it from scratch, but let's use the platformer tutorial as the starting point. To make it more interesting, we are going to change the player and the level art. In the description of the video, you will found the different links to the art assets that we have used. The first one is a good warrior with a good sword. We have found a very good pixel art warrior from Ichio user Pella or that we will be using. So, download it into your disc. Although we could use the same level art, as the platformer demo, the result would not be the same, so let's use some interesting pixel art tile set for our background. We are going to use this castle platformer tile set from Ichio user Rotting Pixels. Let's download it too. We may also be needing to change the enemy, but it will depend on the length of the video, so in case we have time, we will be using the skeleton enemy from Ichio user Moonja. Finally, what would be a sword game without a good swoosh? Nothing, so we have found one freesound.org from user Danjocross. The format is not MP3, so we will have to convert it later on. Let's go to GDevelop. The first thing that we are going to change are the animations of the player, so replace the existing animations with the ones that we have downloaded from the internet. Be careful to change the frame rate in the new animations that have more than one frame. We are using 4 frames per second animations, so the timing should be set to Finally add the two new animations that are not included with the standard character, attack and hit. Take note, that they are not looped. Personally, we don't like the origin of the characters that are defined in the platformer tutorial, 
so let's change the origins to be in the bottom center part of the sprites by clicking on the editing points. When you apply the changes, you will see that we are left with a very small player that is almost invisible, or almost like a flea. For this to work, you also need to change the origin point for the player hitbox object. Let's run the game. And we have a game with a flea jumping and killing monsters. That can be fun for a demo, but that was not the real intention. So let's scale the player up. But we have a problem. As we increase the size, we can see that the character becomes very blurry. Don't panic, it is very easily fixed. By default, GDevelop tries to smooth the sprites that it uses, so we need to tell it to avoid it. For this, we need to make changes in the project settings. The first one is by going to the project manager, game settings and then, properties. In the new windows for the project properties, scroll down to the scale mode, which will be set as linear, and switch it to nearest, which will keep the pixel art look. By itself, it will not solve the issue, we need then to go again into the project manager, game settings, and then click on resources. This will list all the resources in the game. If you scroll down, you will see your recently added sprites. If you click on any of them, you can see that they have an option called smooth that is enabled. Uncheck it for all the new images, and return to the scene view. It will take some time to refresh in the editor view, but if you play the game now, you can play with a pixel art giant. Let's size down the player to a more logical size and let's start adding the logic. Let's create a new group for combat and a new sub-event. The first thing that we want to do, is to check if the attack button has been pressed and if the player is not currently attacking. We can do this by checking that the attack animation is not being played and, that any previous animation has finished.
let's add the trigger once option too, to make sure that we can attack only once. So, if everything is okay, we are going to play the attack animation. Before testing it, we need also to make sure that no other event will cut the animation. Since we are in the platformer demo, there is already animation transitions defined so let's search for them in the code. And we can see that towards the top, there is a condition associated with the player being on the floor that will make it transition between idle, run, and jumps. So, let's add a condition to check that any animation that could have been playing is finished. Let's run the game and try to attack. Yes, we can. We also can check that we have a slight mistake with the origin point of the player that makes it hover in the air. We will adjust it. OK fixed. So we can perform all the movements associated with the player, plus we can attack. At least perform the attack movement. Time to try to make some damage. For that, we need a hitbox for the sword, and that will be the element that will detect the enemies. The larger the hitbox the larger the range of the weapon. In our case, we are going to use a small box in front of the player. So let's create a new sprite object, and paint it in orange with Piskel. Let's put the origin point in the bottom center too. So, now we have a way to detect enemies and make them damage, but in melee combat systems, we also have to take into account the frame or group of frames where the damage can actually be done. This means that we need to have a way to tell the hitbox that it is active or not. For this, let's create a new object variable for the sword hitbox. Let's name it damage enabled with an initial value of 0. A value of 0 will represent no damage and a value of 1 that can damage can be applied. So, our hitbox is currently not moving, but in the game, it will have to be moving in front of the player, and when the player turns, it will have to turn too, as to perform damage in the opposite direction. For these, we need to be able to calculate the different positions of the hitbox. So, let's create a new object variable in the player hitbox called flipped with an initial value of 1, which means that he is not flipped. Let's make the sword hitbox rock. At the beginning of the event sheet, you can see that there is an action to move the player sprite to the player hitbox position. Let's copy this action and paste it below. Replace the player sprite with the sword hitbox and then in the formula for the calculation of the new x, let's add the value of the player hitbox variable, flipped, multiplied by 50. This will make the box move 50 pixels in front of the player, based on the value of the variable flipped. So if flipped is minus 1, instead of plus 50, it will actually use minus 50.
To complete it, let's go to the event where the player is flipped and add two new actions, where if the player is not flipped, then we set the variable flipped to 1. If the player is flipped, then we will set the variable flipped to minus 1.5. The reason for the difference is to compensate for the difference of the width in the character, which makes it asymmetrical when rotating. If we ran the game, you can see that the sword hitbox is following us correctly and it is always in front of the player. We may maybe adjust somewhat the distance, and let's replace the 50 by 70 in the formula that moves the sword hitbox. Okay. Now, Let's actually trigger the damage on the hitbox. For that, we will need to know, when the attack animation has reached the frame where it can perform damage, and use it to set the damage in the sword hitbox. So, let's go down to the combat group. Add a sub-event, to the event where we are playing the attack animation and check if the frame number for the animation is 2, which is the frame in our animation where the damage could be done. Depending on your animations, the value will be different. So, if the animation is at frame number 2, then we can set the variable damage enabled of the sword hit bot to 1. We also need to tell it when it should stop doing damage. So, let's copy the event, and modify it to check if the attack animation was being played and has finished, then to set the variable damage enabled of the sword hit box back to zero. Time to effectively do the damage. The damage to the enemies is being done in an external event sheet called Enemies Management. Open it. Look for the events where the player hitbox is doing damage to the enemies, and copy that event. Replace the player hitbox with the sword hitbox and add a new condition where we are going to check if the value of variable damage enabled is 1, in which case the damage will be done to the enemy. In the actions for that event, remove the action simulate pressing jump key because we don't want to jump when killing enemies with our sword. Let's delete the sub event associated with the player not falling which doesn't apply in this case. Let's run it. It seems that we are not doing any damage, which means that the variable of sword hitbox is not shifting to 1.
We need to check what is happening in the combat group. The sub event where we are testing the frame is not being called, because the condition will be true only once. So we need to move it to another event where in the condition we will be checking for the animation being played as attack, and it is has not yet finished. Let's run the game. And if we don't do anything, the enemies are not killed by our hitbox. If attacking, then the enemy is killed, but also all the enemies that get inside the sword hitbox afterward. This means that we have an error. So, the error is in the combat system, and basically because we are not resetting the damage enabled to zero. Let's change the event to set the value zero, every time any other animation that attack. Let's run the game. And we have a melee attack working correctly. Let's add now the famous swoosh sound. Before we can apply it, we need to convert it to MP3, because when we downloaded it from the free sound website it was in another format. To convert it, let's edit with an application called Audacity. We can trim off some of the beginning and the end of the sound effect, and then export it as MP3. Once exported, we can then play it from gdevelop. Let's try some attacks. Cool, we love the sound of swooshes in the morning. Finally, let's start hiding the different control objects that we have created. As a bonus, let's bring to life some medieval level as mock-ups. 
We will use one of the example images downloaded with the castle tileset, put it on the screen as a sprite, and then using different blocks with different platform behavior, create a small sandbox. Let's place some of the existing block with the platform jump through behavior in the level. Let's check how how it looks running. Let's use the ladder too.
let's hide the new level elements. Let's delete some of the level's assets that we don't need. Some of the blocks will be set to jump through. And others, in red, will be set to platform. Let's place blocks around the level where we have walls that will block the player. Let's hide the new level elements. For the moment, the camera is only following the player in the x-axis. Let's make it follow him in the y-axis, by copying the action and replacing the x-parameter with the y.
Okay, we have stopped here, because while testing the level, we have seen that the attack movement was somewhat strange, and looking better we have seen that the sprites were somewhat displaced in the images. So, using Piskel, we have changed them to make a more natural movement when anticipating the attack and then attacking. In the following video, we will implement the skeleton enemy to have really standoff between good and evil. We hope that you have liked this video. If it has been the case, consider subscribing, giving a like, and clicking on the notification button. If you have any questions, problems, or comments, don't hesitate in putting a comment and we will answer as fast as we could. See you in the next video game developers.